Okay, we'll go straight into PGS. So time lapse, there's some argument whether it improves the embryo, but I think one of the big benefits that I'm going to be discussing here is uh, as a tool to select um, the embryo for transfer. Um, so the PGS, it doesn't improve the embryo in any way. Either the embryo is unemployed, it's employed, and that's it. We've got the PGS to, to work with. So generally speaking, it's not going to increase the chance of pregnancy. It's going to potentially get the patient pregnant faster because if it has a normal embryo there, you're probably going to transfer that in the first fresh cycle as opposed to waiting several frozen cycles later. And if you have a normal embryo there, then the data uh, suggests that the chances of pregnancy would be equivalent irrespective of age. So there was a big debate uh, in the literature um, a couple of years ago uh, on time-lapse and PGS. And can we use time-lapse to predict PGS? And the benefits of that would be because not every clinic is able to have the techniques uh, to be able to biopsy. Um, there's an extra charge. It's a lot more expensive per patient, the PGS and the time lapse is. So if you could do it with the time lapse on its own, then that would be beneficial, at least economically, for the patient. So the first, patient, the first um, paper to suggest this uh, was written by Alison and looks at Yes, maybe there is some evidence suggesting that you can predict uh, an euploid embryo just based on morphokinetics. This was further supported by Marcus in the same um, very shortly after, um, suggesting, yeah, it makes sense. And then the Italians came out of the woodwork. And the cautionary note uh, went on and on about how, well, the evidence we've got so far, if you're looking at day five blastocysts and day six blastocysts, there's no difference in ploidy rates between those two. That was one of the arguments they used. Um, I discussed in the previous talk how if you're not using time-lapse, day five and day six is not really that accurate. So, so when it came to uh, the rebuttal, um, Alison gave the, some very nice points on how you can't really use non-time-lapse papers to, to argue with the time-lapse because they're measuring embryo development in a very different way. Um, there was also a little discussion that the Italians suggested that maybe um, there was an age bias in your data and that data regarding the age was demonstrated in this rebuttal and clearly demonstrating statistically that the age factor and the ploidy factor were independent factors in the data. So it was a really nice debate, which happened in a very short amount of time, but others jumped in. So um, these are um, Escheri and ASRM. I, I went through this period where I was so obsessed with time lapse, I would go around and taking pictures of every poster that was out there. And I have a really nice database of uh, all these posters that came early on. And these are just a few examples of some of these uh, studies. And what they looked at, they looked at mean plus or minus standard deviation, various time points. Nope, no difference at all. Very small numbers, the majority of these. I mean, we're talking about back in 2013. Um, 2014, we had um, this paper come out saying, yep, definitely does not, you cannot use time lapse to predict ploidy. And this one, slightly more on the optimistic side, saying, okay, currently you can't do it, but there is a potential in the future. So this is kind of a summary of the literature in a nutshell. Um, but let's go, let's look at it in a little bit more detail. So this is the, the infamous graph that has been plastered everywhere. Um, so you have time of blastulation uh, on the x-axis, time of starter blastulation on the y-axis. So what we're looking at is these late developers here from a time of blastulation point of view. These are all going to have a high risk, or well, that's what the model suggests, of being aneuploid. Um, you have this medium risk here where not only the time of blastulation, but also the time of starter blastulation is then taken into account, and then a low risk here. So the majority of these embryos are expected, according to this model, to be, have normal genetics. And then there was a follow-up paper. 
Now, this follow-up paper was looking at implantation, but it was kind of suggesting that, okay, so here's a, a bigger data set, looking at a different angle, different set of patients, and if you can kind of make this uh, suggestion that the euploid embryos are going to lead to pregnancy. But the interesting thing with, the, with this is that the similar pattern was seen. So you have now very low numbers at the time, but you know, enough numbers to get plastered all over the news. Um, but interestingly, this actually got replicated from various different sources. So this one is the Fertility Tech, the, um, the Fertility Tech, well back then it was Fertility Tech, uh, Tech Note, and they were looking at the implantation rate, um, and again, 10% implantation rates in the high risk category, 37% implantation rate in the medium, 65 implantation. So independent data demonstrating the same thing. Another one, this one's from Turkey, now looking at live births, 26%, uh, 37%, 47.5%. So when the distribution of the embryos for, for this category and that one are about the same, but twice the live birth rate. So very different sources coming up with the same conclusions. So we gathered our data. So this is Boston Place Clinic data. And what we found was actually in the high category rate, we had a very low implantation rate, but the medium and the low had very similar implantation rates. When we're looking at, sorry, ploidy rates, sorry, this is ploidy, so red is aneuploid, blue is euploid. And then we looked at the implantation, at the implantation rate, we saw similar patterns. So why are there all this discrepancy? Why are different people seeing different things? So I tried to come up with a logic behind it, okay? Because that's, I don't like disagreements, so. Um, and this kind of summarizes for me how I see time-lapse and how I see time-lapse improving in embryo selection. So if you look at the white rectangles, these are the cleaved embryos. So what you have in the x-axis here is the, is the time point, hours post-insemination. And over here, you have the various morphokinetic parameters that we can annotate. And what you see, and this is consistent throughout, is that it narrows down from the embryos that only cleave, but don't form a blastocyst. And then those that blastulate, they're a bit narrower. And then those that lead on to implant are even narrower. The means for some of these parameters and this are, are probably going to be very similar. But it's really the outliers, it is that skirting from the normal distribution data that, that um, shows for me that time lapse can be used as a deselection for all of these outliers. And what I thought was, okay, next let's look at, at the ploidy, and I expected it would be even narrower with the ploidy. But I was actually surprised that wasn't the case. So what, what we're looking at here is the various uh, parameters that we assess, and the hours is now up here. I'm just trying to keep you on your toes, so we switched it. Um, and consistently, what we notice is that the aneuploid ones, which are the red ones, they tend to have this slower lag here compared to the blue ones. So can you see this is consistently throughout? But if you look at the minimum values, they actually are not that different from the aneuploid to the euploid. So it's not that it gets narrower, it's that it's, it's the upper tail that gets chopped off. And this is kind of demonstrated again when you look at the pace of embryo development, where it's the faster moving embryos, sorry, my mistake, the slower moving embryos, because the more time, so the slower moving embryos are going to be uh, more likely to be aneuploid. So if you think about the model, the Campbell model, which was that graph where you had a line and anything above that is going to be high risk, that kind of applies, at least in our data, to quite a lot of the parameters, as long as you put the barrier in the right place. And try to see if there's anybody else out there in the literature who has actually found the same thing. This is the closest I could get, uh, which is a Spanish group, and they were looking at 3PNs, and they did PGS on these three pens and found that some of them were actually diploid. Um, and they went on to 
conclude that the deployed 3PNs, this is getting very confusing, but the, the 3PNs that have normal genetics actually developed in a normal way, but the, the triploid 3PNs were actually slower. So maybe there isn't a potential argument, I'm speculating here, but it's work in progress, but I, I reckon there is something about them being slower. So why do we have all these discrepancies between, oh, uh, so a little bit more on my theory of what's going on here. Um, morphology, why isn't that enough? And I think it's because the morphology, and this sentence kind of sums it up, every scar I have makes me who I am. So for the embryo is every fragment I am tells a story of what happened in the past. Every uneven cell I've got is some difficulty I had at a cell division. So it's something that happened in the past. By the time we, we notice it, it's already happened. It's not happening with the embryo right now. So that's the past. Morphokinetics is kind of including the metabolism a little bit, so you're looking at the pace of embryo development. So that's kind of the present, what's happening right now at that particular point that you're examining that embryo. And the genetics kind of, okay, maybe some of the genes might be associated with the first five days of development, but there's going to be a whole lot of other genes which are not. So to go from an embryo all the way to a baby, there's going to be all this sat-nav instructions uh, which are going to be hidden there. So I can never see that uh, time-lapse is going to replace PGS because not all of the genes are involved in the first five days of embryo development. So biologically for me it doesn't make sense that it would ever get to the point where it would replace it. Just to overcomplicate things, but this is kind of where I think things are going. So if you have a Venn diagram to try and determine viability, really simplistically just looking at these three um, factors that we're looking at. If you have abnormal morphokinetics, so you're looking at outside the circle, I mean, we're looking at mitotic errors leading to aneuploidy, uh, so because it's, it's outside the genetic circle, but not affecting genes crucial for blastulation. Or um, if you're looking in this one here, errors in genetic instruction for future embryo development. Metabolism is just too fast and it's overusing its limited cytoplasmic resources or maybe it's too slow and the mitotic cycle is disrupted. So there's various reasons why an embryo will have abnormal morphokinetics but normal morphology and normal genetics. But it kind of needs at least a minimum amount of normality coming from all three sides in order for it to be a viable embryo. But when morphology fails, time lapse gives you more. So what you sometimes see is this eoploid embryo with normal kinetics, abnormal morphology, but it's pregnant. So this is our CC embryo which extruded a considerable amount and this is a live birth baby today. And on the other hand, you have this embryo which is eoploid, normal kinetics, good morphology, and still the patient didn't get pregnant. Okay, that one hasn't quite popped up the numbers, but essentially you can only see from the graph that this is the trophectoderm, so A is B to C. This C grade was 20% of our C graders will lead to implantation. So clearly morphology doesn't have the full picture. And I reckon there's also things outside the lab. I mean, we're looking at the uterine environment. We're looking at other lab factors. I mean, um, practitioner technique, toxins, VLCs. We also saw the quality control stuff. But we're also looking at things inside the embryo that we're not even measuring yet. So the metabolism of this embryo, uh, what is this embryo extruding into the media? What is it taking in from the media? Uh, other pathology elements, non-chromosomal genetic orders. So the list goes on. So even with time lapse, even with PGS, we still don't have the full picture. So the way I see it, it's not PGS versus time lapse, it's PGS and time lapse. And you still got to use them together. And we believed so much that you should have time-lapse, that all our embryos are cultured in time-lapse incubators. We believe so much in the PGS that we, we do this actually fairly regularly. So this is our warm biopsy we freeze. If a patient has more embryos than they're going to be using for a frozen embryo cycle, economically it makes sense for them to warm all these embryos, biopsy them, refreeze and find out whether these embryos are worth transferring back. So instead of paying for three, four, I mean some of these patients, these were the first eight cases that we've done of this. Some of them have eight embryos, eight FETs, and they would have been um, all abnormal from a genetic point of view. This patient now has just got a fetal, well she's actually got twin fetal hearts, but we told her to have just one, but anyway, um, from doing a fresh cycle. 
But had she not done this warm biopsy refreeze, she would still be there doing these eight embryo transfers before getting to this stage. Um, you will note that of these embryos, and there's about 50 embryos in here or so, um, they all survived. So our survival rates with uh, vitrification are, is above 97%. So we have really good survival rates. So um, we are quite confident that this is the way forward and it benefits every patient. Because either you are scenario one where you got a normal embryo, and in this case, two out of three got clinically pregnant. The third patient actually did get pregnant. She got pregnant again uh, later on, but she just miscarries, and this is her history. She has a history of miscarriage, so clearly, at least she knows that it's nothing to do with the ploidy of the embryo. Um, and this last group of patients have just moved on to a fresh cycle after discarding. So we believe in PGS, we believe in time lapse, and we believe in using them together. Um, just a, a brief on some other things that time-lapse has helped us in our biopsy program. We have quite an active biopsy program. Um, so the first one is accurate assessment of the blastulation. So actually knowing that your embryos are actual blastocysts, because if you're only checking it once, you will miss a considerable proportion of your blastocysts. Trying to determine the best time, um, the best time to, to biopsy without multiple removals from the incubator. So just having a look in the morning going, oh, okay, embryos are a bit, a bit early right now. Let's wait for the afternoon and the biopsy in the afternoon. Assessing survival post biopsy. So I've shown you some videos of that. And in some rare cases where you're about to biopsy and the bloody thing is collapsed and where the hell is the inner cell mass? So what we do then is we can look at features in the zona and look in the embryoscope and see if we can determine where that inner cell mass is. And if we're confident, then we can go ahead with the biopsy. Uh, otherwise, you have to wait. But it gives you that extra potential of going ahead, which makes your lab run a bit more smoother and more efficient. In terms of selection of embryos for biopsy, because obviously there is an extra cost if you have a large number of good quality embryos. So um, this, it can be useful when the patient is tied from a financial point of view. Um, and when you have more than one normal embryo, you are going to need further um, parameters to help choose. Um, and as a last point, it gives you more information. And in terms of investigating, when it comes back, this particular patient has three no results. And you go, okay, generally speaking, the no results rates are okay in the lab, but let's go back and let's have a, a look at this embryo. We, we film our biopsies as well, so we can review, and we can go back and look at how it's re-expanded. And it just gives you that extra information three weeks later, which you wouldn't have did you, if you didn't have time lapse. Um, and the same with regarding to, should we transfer this embryo back when it's a partial or a mosaic? Um, just to further discuss with the patients. So the way that we see it is it's not just about having all this extra information. It's what you do with it that counts. And this is how you're really going to see the benefits of time lapse. So thank you.